good evening to everybody that's here. Where is everybody? Y'all make them mad? Well, I, I appreciate y'all being here. I don't know what we did everybody else. They may be wore out from vacation. I thought everybody would be back since school starts here in a day or two. Huh? Well, that's all right. The ones of us are here, we're going to enjoy what we got, right? Um, I want to do some prayer requests before we start. Then we're going to sing a couple songs. Um, I, I want to ask you one, just, just well, I don't, know how, I don't know how you put it. I don't know if that's praying for me or praying for the staff or praying for you or praying for the church, probably all of the above. But um, I know everybody, a lot of people have been wondering, and I know we devoted to sell land, and that was a lot of money, and that was a long time ago. And there's been a lot of negotiations back and forth, a lot of things. It's not a done deal, uh, although it has a contract. It's not a done deal because the contract has some time riders on it, some do, things called due diligence, and there's a lot of work. Um, there, there's, there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of stuff this week. I'll just, I'll just ask you just, just pray about it. I, 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 I feel like I have given it to the Lord. It's not mine to worry about. I, um, I. We, we picked the line in the sand and drawn the line, and it's kind of like as far as we're going to go. And um, I truly, I'm sleeping good. I feel like I give it, Lord, I feel like I'm doing good, but my, my stomach says otherwise. My, my stomach's telling me I'm, I must be a little nervous. Um, but you know what? It's all right. It, it really is, but it, it's going to be more all right when God's people pray. Um, so I just I just ask you to, to be Praying as, as we still work through some some negotiations. In all honesty, in my opinion, they have a lot to do with the future of this church. They they really do. They have a lot to do with where we are and what we can do in ministries we can do and things in this town. But I, I don't need to I don't need to get sideways about stuff that God's got in His hand. If God wants those things to happen, then those things happen. And if He don't, I just I just need to stay out of the way. Um, so I already gave you guys last week about Brother Woody and those guys in the Philippines. Just just keep praying there. Hunter Hutchins having another surgery. There's some polyps in his throat. <coughs> it's a result from back when he had the vent for so long. And when he was down in Florida. And he still got the trait. But they're going to go in and take, remove some polyps. And they say it's very small and very quick. But it, they got to leave the trach in. For another week or so afterwards in case they have any other things. So the trach's still there and still going to be there for a little while. Um, certainly for Jonathan and Julie, man, it's just, it's weighing on them pretty heavy. Um, being in Atlanta, John knows, being in Atlanta every day and all day and sitting in those hospital rooms and seeing seeing your child go through that kind of therapy. And to be honest, therapy, I've told y'all, that's a scientific word for torture. Um, therapy's painful in a lot of cases, so... They're, they're, they're kind of done, so pray for Jonathan and Julie and um, just, just strength for them. Uh, Mr. Norman Smith, have you heard from him? He'll be home for lunch tomorrow. Awesome. We'll make sure we tell God thank you for Mr. Norman Smith. Healed up and out of the therapy and getting to come home from Noonan tomorrow. Um, I got I got Miss Freda and Mr. Freddie together now. <laughs> we just we just how about just household? We just pray for that household. When when the main boss is, is is down, it becomes a household deal. But it's good to see you. That's a blessing just to be able to be out. You feeling good? We talked the other day about that appetite and how good some of those hamburgers looked. Have you tried one of them yet? You did what? <laughs> well, you're getting closer to that one bite of a hamburger, one one bite at a time. I just some some somebody's got to get her a Sonic burger. Uh, she's starting to get a little craving back, and that's at the top of the list. So, <clears throat> so certainly <laughs> keep praying for the continued healing. But um, you tell God, thank you, um, thank you for some blessings. While I'm while I'm on some. Some thank yous. We were just talking about it a, a minute ago. He was asking about my back and recommendations. So I did get some pictures taken on Monday at Houston Orthopedics. And 
I don't remember what he told me I did, but I tore something. All I know is when from that fall that broke my arm, I thought I must have broke something. I do have a couple of bone spurs. I broke something somewhere back there before and didn't even know it. But um, at, at any rate, I appreciate your prayers. And I always want to be careful to give God thanks and praise for what he did. Um, so nothing was broken. Something was torn. I forget what he called it. And he said, um, the, the downside to what you did to those kind of tears are they are excruciatingly painful. I said, well, you're in my neighborhood. We're talking the right language because I believe you might be on the right path right here. Uh, he said, but the good side to it is they heal themselves in about six weeks. And Friday will be six weeks. And I'm about, I told him, I have no business being in your office wasting your time. I'm just concerned about the fall. And he said, oh, you're always reason to be here. But at any rate, I, I appreciate your prayers, man. That was, a, that, was a rough, that was a rough three weeks. That was like kidney stone level pain. I'd just soon not try that again. I wished I knew what I did because I'd make sure I never did it again. But you ever didn't do nothing and got hurt? I literally was the definition of I didn't do nothing. I just, I just all of a sudden got hurt. So, but I, I appreciate your prayers while we're thanking God for all the many answered prayers. That that's one of them. I greatly appreciate it. Miss Nancy Giggins doing better. She's actually here Sunday. I didn't get to speak to her. She sent me a message when I checked on her. Said she's able to be here. Um, so that that's a big plus. But keep praying for Miss Nancy. Larry Estes had an MRI yesterday. Um, had to go down to Columbus. They call it an open MRI. He can't stand them little closed up things. And um, But anyway, he was able to get the MRI. Don't have the results back yet. There seems to be some issues. Um, not really sure just what that is. But what I am sure of is God knows what that is. And what I am sure of is God knows how to fix it. And I know God can choose to take some time and fix it with doctors and different things. And God can choose to just touch it um, and, and say it was a tear and just fix it. So, But but he's still having to use his walker. He's still in, in a good bit of pain, still going through quite a bit. I ask you to continue to just pray for Brother Larry, MRI results and those kind of things. Um, a lot of the rest of these you'll, you'll have on yours. They're, they're family members. A lot of them are call-ins. Um, Teresa's dad, Mr. Ed, you continue to pray for him that, that they've had some issues. He's in the treatments for cancer, but he's had some other treatments in the process of all of it. So I'll just I ask you to continue to pray for them. Um, for Clyde, we're just going to keep praying. Yeah, we, we, we're praying for insurance and doctors to get together. Um, get some new wires. He still needs those wires replacing his heart for the pacemaker, and it's been a, an ongoing thing. It's bad when they tell you something is necessary and relatively urgent, need to get it done. And what I guess five months later, we're still talking about it. Um, three months, probably seems like seven months to him. So going on four months, that between insurance and doctors, they still don't have worked out what they say needs to be done. Alyssa Matheny's mom, Miss Jennifer Moore. Um, had an, had another fall, so I'd ask you to just keep praying for her. She is there at Florence Hand. Um, by the way, oh, that's where some of our people are right now. I forgot about that. That's tonight. Um, Florence Hand is the birthday party. So some of the ones from church here have gone, and, and we got three teenagers sitting back there in the back. They're going to hang out with us since they didn't get to go. I'm sorry they left, y'all. That's just rude, uncalled for. They left earlier on the van. They went over to Florence Hand. Today's a birthday party that they're doing there for them and carried some gifts and playing some games with them. Tonight's the first night. I'd ask you to pray for that ministry. I believe that can be very beneficial, very helpful. I would like to be able to, to start doing that to move that up to twice a month. Right now we just have once a month planned at Florence Hand, but I don't want to leave out Twin Fountains. They, they need some help there as well, so I'd like to be able, maybe do it twice a month. But we're going to try it for about these first three months. The first two are on Wednesday nights. Then we're going to try one on a Sunday night, and then we go to Monday nights um, for the last two months of the year. Um, so I'd ask you to just keep keep praying there, Mr. Sam and, and Kathy Brauner. Um, Jerry and Cheryl, uh, Sherry Presnell, uh, Cheryl Presnell, I, I haven't heard back. She was put in the hospital on a vent. Sunday? Yeah. Um, that was Sunday, wasn't it? 
I can't, I can't remember. So she's doing, she's doing better. But both of them, you know, they've been on a prayer list literally years. But they, they truly need a lot of prayer. If you keep lifting up both of them, um, certainly Michelle Pickles. Good, good to see her. Just keep praying for Michelle. She sent me an abbreviated text. She sends me a text a lot of times. But one day she just sent me three praying hands. I don't know if that means she couldn't see good today or she didn't feel good, but I understand what three praying hands says. So I just sent the same back to her. Um, so I didn't know if that meant she wasn't feeling as good today, but she didn't miss an opportunity to send me a text that she was praying for us tonight. Um, Kelly Anderson, um, both families involved there. Kathy Shoemaker, doing doing really well. I just continue to pray or for healing there, Lori Barr's mom and the dementia, that, that's a struggle. That's, a, that's still a battle for them. Uh, Brother Terry Aldridge, uh, if you look on here, you're going to have faiththegrange.com to see most of these. Who's these texting me? Um, hey, Stacy, wherever the camera's at. I remember Stacy, she texted me to please pray for us in Iowa. She put Iowa, so I wouldn't tell y'all she was in Ohio again. I know she's trying to make sure I got it right. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know anything other than what you just got. I just got a text message to please pray for us um, here in Iowa. Oh, that's on Cheryl. Cheryl's having problems breathing this morning. Is this an update from today? Cheryl's having problems breathing this morning. Be doing an endoscopy today to see if they can figure this out. She'll be sedated again, hoping this will work. Um, if not, she'll go back on the ventilator. Needs prayers, keys. And that, that was, um, um, I guess that was on um, Susan White post, posted. Huh? Okay. Ask her, I already answered that. <laughs> They're sitting on the front row texting me now. Y'all stop that. Y'all stop that. Y'all pray with it. Yeah, so I've already done that, but it's doing really good. I appreciate it, brother. Um, any, any more prayer requests? Anybody we need, we need to add to this list or add to Faith of Grange? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank the Lord for answering the prayer. Now he just, he, he's, he's going to finish what he started. Finish what he started. Amen. Wow. Wow. Any more prayer requests? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't know if y'all can hear Nick and Katie Morris sit right up here. Um, it's Katie's mom had a cyst removed from somewhere on her head. But if y'all just add, let me go ahead and add that one to mine real quick. Anybody else while I'm, while I'm adding this? Anybody else have a prayer request? Yes, sir. That's your son-in-law? I'm not like these teenagers. It takes me a minute. I should have just got one of y'all back off that back road to do this for me. It ought to be done by now. I got, huh? Huh? Yeah, if one of them would just come on up here, this would already be done. Anybody else need to add? Well, yes, sir. How your kidney stones doing, man? How your kidney stones doing? When you text me, I was on the floor. 
Yeah, I understood exactly what you were dealing with. I was about as close to a kidney stone as I wanted to get. Well, I'm glad to see you up doing better anyway. You've been carrying that thing around, what, a year and a half now? Since what? Seven years? But they got doctors to break them things up. Lord have mercy. I done had to have something done. I ain't man enough to put up with a kidney stone seven years. Whew. Yeah. I certainly pray pray for Junior's family. Um, wow. Man, I tell you what, y'all need to get out of that lane. Y'all been in the y'all been driving down the rough road for a long time. Miss Frieda. With what y'all been dealing with, you probably want to settle on the road a little further away. That that little section right there has been on a rough road for the last little while, man. Goodness gracious. Confidence. Every storm has an end, right? Every storm has an end. Any more prayer requests? Well, let's pray and we'll sing a song. Father, thank you so much, God. Lord, I... And hear the praise reports, God. We just want to be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory. Tell you, thank you, God. We spend a lot of time on prayer requests. We spend a lot of time, God, asking you to heal things, fix things, do things, financial things, marital things. God, we bring you one problem after another. And we spend so much time before you, God, bringing problems, God. And you spend so much time answering them. And we spend so little time saying thank you, Father. God, I pray you just, just help us, God, to be, to be faithful to remember, Lord. And we just take a minute. God, to, to say thank you, Lord, it just brings me back even to what we put in the bulletin this week about how many seconds you give us each day and how we spent one of them just to say thank you, God. Thank you for this night. Thank you for your word, for the opportunity to look into it, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of your word, to, to grow in wisdom, God, that we can come before you according to James 1, 5 and ask for wisdom, God, and know that you'll give us wisdom and guidance and direction, Lord, and that you told us to pray for the sick, that the prayer of faith would heal the sick, God, and we lift all these up to you, Father. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight, Lord. May we just worship you, God. I pray you'd just shake off the dust of the world, God. I pray you'd help us to set all things aside, God, and just, Lord, just sit back in some fellowship and spend a little time in your word. Lord, I pray most of all that everything we do be pleasing to you, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Y'all ready to sing a couple songs? It always helps. You ready, brother? I'm ready. Good evening. Everybody stand with me tonight. Well, not with me, but stand tonight. I, I could stand, but it <clears throat> would be a little difficult. You know, there's nobody in this world who can think your spouse loves you, your kids love you. Um, your grandkids, your cat, your dog, your fur babies, your best friend, whoever. You can believe that they love you. And sometimes, you know, there is true love there. But there is nobody in this world, in this lifetime, that has ever loved you. Or will ever love you right now or love you in the future. No matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, all of those things. In Jesus Christ. You think about before you were even born that Jesus from the foundation of the world was the lamb that was already slain for you. That's what kind of love that he has. For you were even conceived in the womb by your mother and your father, your heavenly father, already loved you, had already sent his son Jesus to die for you. And that's where my heart is tonight is I'm just overwhelmed at how much God loves us, how much the Lord does for us over and above beyond anything we could ask or think. So we'll start off tonight with one of our favorites, My Savior's Love. You know, this is like my favorite song of all time, just about. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the
for me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous fact of how much God loves us, how deep his love is, <clears throat> in knowing all those things that he's prepared for all those things that are eternal in our life, that all the things that are temporary in this life that we can know <clears throat> that no matter what, we can say that it is well with our soul. It may not be well with everything going on, but we can say with our soul it is well. That is the confidence we have because that Jesus loved us, because Jesus cares for us every, let me tell you this, this for some, some of us, you think about this, that God cares enough about some of us that's a little thin on top, that even he counts our very hairs on our head. That's how much he cares about us. He already said that those two little farlings, those little sparrows over there, that he cares far more about us and yet he provides every one of their needs every single day. We got a little old orange cat at the house. He's, he's a little orange tabby cat and the, cat, the kids, for whatever reason, always come up with food names for these animals. We have had a hot dog, we've got a chicken. We Now this poor cat's name is Dorito, but everybody calls him Rito. And this poor little orange cat, never would come in the house. We would try to get him to come in the house and he just wouldn't come in. And, uh, but he wants you to love on him all the time. You go out on the front porch to feed him. He wants you to just pet him and love him. He's meows and meows and, and drive you nuts if you're just trying to sit on the front porch. And, um, you know, since we've been gone from the house and stuff, I hadn't seen him for a long time. I'd go by the house. He wouldn't be there. And we had bought some food, put it out and thinking maybe he's getting it here and there. One day he showed up again, just out of the blue. Here he was. Boy, he was poor. He was poor and pitiful. Here he's sitting up there. I mean, he was skin and bones. That poor little cat was. 
So I got some canned food, put it out there for him, and uh, he lapped that stuff up. Boy, he was he was over. He was glad to have that food. And I was I got to thinking about you know at that point I was trying to pet him and stuff like he had been, and he didn't want me to touch him. He didn't want me to pet him. He wasn't meowing for me to pet him, which was very strange because this is like the had been the most loving cat. But what had happened is he had gotten away from the one that had been providing all his needs. You think about that. He he had gone off, wandered off. We were still stopping by the house, checking on things time to time, trying to put food out. But at some point in time, he decided he's going to go on his own, and he just wandered on off on his own little way and became real pitiful, malnourished. Well, guess what? Since that day, guess what he's doing? coming up there on that front porch, meowing, want somebody to pet him, want somebody to feed him. So now he's then got all those workers that's over there been tearing out demo in the house and stuff. He's then got all them trained to bring him food out there. So he's probably getting fed like three or four times a day now. But you know, I thought about this, you know, everybody, the two other cats that we have that are in the house, and I know this is a crazy story, but there's an application behind it because those two cats that are in the house, that stayed in the house, that wanted to be in the house, all their needs taken care of. They're always close to the master. They're always right there. Every need that they want is supplied for them right there. But here, this little old orange cat, that's the most loving one of all three of them, wandered off, basically almost died. Made me think of the little prodigal son over there. Wandered off from the father, but now that he's come back home, all of his needs being supplied again. Boy, ain't that good of God of us that sometimes we wander off, not intentionally sometimes. Sometimes things come in our life that disrupts everything in it. Everything disrupts our whole world, our whole life. And sometimes we may still go to church. We may still do these things, do that, whatever. But boy, we wander off from God, our heart. It, we may be in his house, but our heart's far away from it. But God's always standing there waiting on us to come right back to where he's at. Supply every one of those needs that we have. And we have confidence that that happens, that God does that for us because he loves us. And because he's already prepared the things for our soul in this life, we can say no matter whatever else is going on in our life, it is well with our soul, regardless of everything else. So I don't know, maybe you're a little orange jelly cat that kind of wandered off, maybe a little malnourished. Maybe tonight's the night you need to come wandering back on that porch. That master's going to be there to take care of you, give you everything you need. He'll even bring some other people around to help feed you and fatten you back up again, you know? Let's sing this tonight as well with my soul. When peace like a river
Amen. Thank you, brother. It is well. Sometimes the situation ain't well, right? That, that can be a tough song to sing sometimes. That's just those times when you have to remember God's got it all under control. If it came my way, it had to come across his desk. Acts chapter 28, if you want to be turned there in your Bibles, we left off. The Apostle Paul has made it to Rome in spite of shipwrecks and all that's there. He's basically under house arrest now. He's chained to a different Roman soldier each day. And we looked at how that would have given the Apostle Paul an opportunity to share the gospel with someone different every day. We look at the fact that that is the case with each one of our lives. We have different opportunities every day to share the gospel with different people. And we looked at the fact Wednesday night, we glanced at it again Sunday morning. We don't have to reach the world. We just have to reach the one. We just have to reach the one that God either sends or allows to be in front of us at a particular time. So Paul would have invested himself personally into these soldiers. There's not a doubt in my mind that the apostle Paul would have spent time witnessing with each of these soldiers, talking to them, talking about their lives with, with Paul's love that he has. He would have been concerned about them and about their well-being, and he would have taken time to kind of build a relationship, I feel like, with each one so that he might take opportunity to talk to each one personally about the love of Christ and about what Christ offers in the love of God, just like we would anybody that's lost today. But these guards did more than just talk with the Apostle Paul. They did more than just hear his testimony. They did more than just carry on a discussion. See, they heard every conversation that the Apostle Paul had. So just think for just a minute, even if, if Paul had not poured himself personally, individually into each one of these guards, think about what they gleaned from being around him. Because you know Paul spent all of his time talking about the goodness of God, the glory of God, the things of Christ. And so the guards just being around him would have seen his communication. They would have seen his level of prayer life. They would have seen his presence before God. They would have seen how he addressed other people and how he acted towards other people all throughout the day. Those things a lot of times are going to have a greater impact on people than anything you can say. Number one, if you're saying it and your words don't match your actions, then your words are a waste of breath. But sometimes you don't have to say anything. If you just live it, people around you are seeing it. If you just live it, people around you are hearing it. Matter of fact, the one you're talking to may not even be the one God's talking to. The one you're talking to about God, it may be the person sitting two tables over right here that's over here in the conversation, happen to hear something. Now they think they're really eavesdropping, but, but God's doing something in their life. Every minute of our life, if you claim to be a Christian, every minute of our life, it is of extreme importance that we maintain a Christian attitude. Because you never know who's looking, but you can rest assured somebody is. You never know who's listening, but we can always know that, that somebody is. So God can use our life to reach those that we're talking to, and we certainly should be. But God can use our life to reach people around that we don't even know he's reaching. God, God can do things through us at all times. And that's, that's Paul's situation here at Rome as he's got these guards around him. And we read verse 17 through 20 last week, and that kind of carried us over to the book of Romans. And we, we took that trip a little bit there at the end, Romans 9, 10, 11, and we looked at the promise, the promise of God towards the Jewish people. And that has a lot to do with what we'll look at tonight that carries on over. We looked at the fact in verse 17 that Paul never forgets the Jews. Paul never forgets his people. He said in verse 17, it came to pass after three days that Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now, when Paul began his ministry, he went into the cities of the Jews. He went to his Jewish brethren, city after city, preaching the gospel, trying, you know, we saw that everywhere he went, the Jews beat him up and ran him out. Everywhere he went, they wanted nothing to do it. But he poured his heart out to the Jews until God sent him to the Gentiles. But even here at Rome, we see Paul hasn't lost his heart for his people. Paul, Paul still has a heart for the Jews. And the fact that he's in bonds makes no difference about his heart. The only difference is he can't go to them, so he sent word to them and said, you come to me. 
He has the elders of the Jews brought in. Now, Paul begins here with kind of a brief and, and very inconclusive explanation of his change. Maybe a few reasons. For one, knowing the Sanhedrin the way that it does, he probably assumes that they've sent some word forward and they've spread their lies and they've told their things. So he doesn't really know what these Jews have heard. So he's kind of careful as to what he says on that perspective. The other is the Romans. You know, he does have the Roman guard. He's got to be careful somewhat what he says there. The Roman guard can misinterpret or misunderstand or misquote. He can go back and tell the Romans and maybe cause some problems. And Paul doesn't really have probably anything bad to say about the Romans right here because all honesty, if you remember back in chapter 22, Tertullus saved his life. If, if, if the chief captain of the guards hadn't come in and got him when the Jews had created the riot in the street and the mob, they would have killed Paul that day. So he, had, he even though they've mishandled his case and kept him falsely in prison for three years, he really still somewhat owes his life to that situation being arrested. <laughs> but, but, but God, God used the Romans in that day. That's important. We sit in our life. God used the Romans that day to pull him out of a mob to save his life. God has used the Romans to feed, shelter, and protect him for three years. We see him as a prisoner, but God's taking care of him because the Jews would have killed him at any given time. Amen. So God used the Jews to, to get him out of that mess. God used the Jews to feed him, take care. I mean, the Jews, I'm sorry. God used the Romans to, to get him out of that mess with the Jews. God used the Romans to, to, to house him for three years, feed him, take care of him. And, and then God used the Romans to get him to Rome, which was God's thing in the first place. As you preach at Jerusalem, so shall you preach at Rome. But yet the Romans aren't Christians. These aren't God's people. You see how God can use people to take care of you? They don't have to be Christians. God can use anybody to affect our life. God can use anybody to accomplish his purpose. God can use anybody out in the world to pay our bills. Everybody we work for and do things for it necessarily a child of God. So we see how God can, can use people. So, so Paul here in this, he could have had this conversation with the Jews in Hebrew, but then the Roman guard might have wondered, he's a Roman citizen. Obviously, he's saying things he don't want me to hear. So what, what we see is that Paul, Paul handles things very delicately. He, he's a little bit, I don't know, a bit of a predicament, if you will. But the truth is, Paul is pretty short-winded in this because Paul didn't come to Rome to talk about Paul. Paul came to Rome to talk about Jesus. That's his whole purpose why God sent him there. So he just, he needs to go ahead and briefly give an explanation of why he's in chains. Because if he doesn't, you know what the Jews are thinking. Why are you in chains? Why, why are you arrested? Why did you come here as a prisoner? And if Paul doesn't go ahead and answer the question, then the whole time he's talking, they're not listening to anything he's got to say. All they're saying is, why are you in chains? They're just waiting to ask the question. They feel like he's dodging something. So he goes ahead and he, he doesn't go into the lies and the false accusations and all that the Sanhedrin did. He doesn't go into all the mistreatment that was there. He says, I have committed nothing against the people. Now, he could have gone into all of his rabbinical training. He could have told them how he was trained under the leadership of Gamaliel. He could have played stuff up, but none of that mattered. That's not why he's here. He says, I haven't done any of that. I, I, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, done anything to, against the customs of our people. Now, that line is important to these Jewish leaders because they're, they're Jews of the law. They're people of the law. They're still bound up in the traditions of the law. But verse 18, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. Now, he's not talking about Roman law. He's talking about accusations by the Jew. It is a fact that they could have proven anything against him, they would have had him killed. We already know from the story in our study, they were going to kill him anyway. They made up their own stories. They had their false accusations. They were going to kill him anyway. But now because he got in this court system, they've got to prove that he was guilty. And there isn't, that they couldn't find any proof because there isn't any. <coughs> they couldn't prove anything against him because there's no proof there. So even, even when Paul's case was brought before Agrippa, you remember we looked at it. Paul also doesn't speak of Agrippa even being there, which he could have. And it would have probably brought some credibility to a story. To, you know, Agrippa would have been highly viewed by the Jews, being a Jew, being a king. <coughs> Excuse me. And so he, he could have brought Agrippa into the equation and, and said, hey, you know, man, he, he came and he heard my case. But at the end of the day, he, he said that, that I was not guilty. He, he said that, that he couldn't find anything wrong. Matter of fact, he said if I wouldn't have appealed to Rome, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Anybody get in a little bit of hay stuff outside? 
Man, I finally made it get my grass cut after my back got better, and I've been paying for that ever since. I don't usually do that. I don't like to do that, but I kind of needed to. I don't want to stand up here and cough the rest of the time. But, but the reality is, even if he had told that, they would have still been talking about, well, if he said you're not guilty, why are you still in chains? So, so none of that really mattered. <coughs> um, so, so, so Paul, 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 Paul makes it clear I, I've had no accusations. He leaves a lot unsaid. He, he says, when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. So he says, I'm, I'm not accusing my nation. Not, I'm not accusing the Sanhedrin. I'm not accusing the Jewish elders. <coughs> I'm sorry, y'all. But, but, but he, he answers a little bit briefly why in the change you can see really how Paul is guided by the Holy Spirit. Because he answers the question really without having to answer the question. He just kind of gives a brief little detail and he leaves a lot unsaid. But he says enough to say, now, let me tell you why I'm really here. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you. To see you and to speak with you. Because it is for the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. They don't know exactly what Paul means at first for the hope of Israel. They had to have liked the sound of that, the hope of Israel. But Paul's talking about the messianic hope. He's talking about the Messiah, the hope of Israel, the hope that the Jews have held on to since the delivering of the law, the promised one, the Messiah, the one that is to come. Paul's great message to the Jew is the Messiah has come. That, that is Paul's message, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to tell them it doesn't undermine the Jewish faith. It enhances it. it. It glorifies it. It is the fulfillment of it. The Messiah has come, and I am an ambassador of that Messiah. That, that's my job. That's what I'm here to tell you. That is why I am in these bonds. It is my commitment to the hope of Israel that has led me to change. <clears throat> Verse number 21, it said, they said to him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake uh, uh, any harm of thee. They said, we, we heard any of this. The, the Sanhedrin, they, they hadn't sent us letters from Jerusalem. We haven't heard any of this information prior to your arrival. I think that'd be a little encouraging to Paul to know that he doesn't have to offend all that, defend against all that garbage and all that stuff. You kind of wonder maybe one or two things. I, I, I was thinking about, I have two perspectives. <coughs> thinking one, maybe the Sanhedrin might have been a little intimidated by Paul, had every reason to be with the power of the Holy Spirit on them and all they've seen. But if they send a letter to Rome and it gets to the Romans... And the Romans find out that they started a riot in the streets and that they beat a Roman citizen. They got a lot of trouble coming. So to risk sending such a letter into Rome with that kind of stuff on it would have been challenging within itself. <clears throat> but I was, I was thinking about something else. I wonder if they did send a letter. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just because they sent it don't mean it got there. See, we never know what God's doing behind the scene. I was thinking, I, I started wondering, you know, it'd be just like God, that they did send a letter to all the accusation. It was in one of those crates that got thrown overboard off that ill-fated ship. So we, we don't know if they didn't send anything or if God just took care of it. But what, what we know is he doesn't have to, <coughs> to answer any of that, that stuff here. They say, we don't know anything about what happened to you, but we desire to hear what thou thinkest for as concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. Now, remember, that's their name for Christianity. They call it a, a sect. They're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. And they say, you know, we, we know Paul knows about this, this sect. They, they could profess ignorance against Paul's crime. They can profess ignorance against why Paul's in change. But they can't profess ignorance about the church because they know all about the church. And it's spoken of everywhere. And the, the, the Christian community there at Rome was the first Christian community to, to, to be um, founded outside of Palestine right after um, Pentecost. The, these Jews left and went to Rome and started a church there at the church at Rome. So 
<coughs> this is one of the first uh, establishments. There's been a lot of dissension at Rome. There's been a lot of disorder between the, the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews. Matter of fact, about 10 years before Paul got there, dissension was so bad that Claudius had many Jews expelled from Rome because of the riots in the street, because of the things that were created. So these Jewish leaders, they know all about Christians. They know about the presence of the Christians, but they're, I don't know, maybe somewhat politely asking whether sincere or not. I don't really know, but they're, they're asking, what is Paul's opinion of this people that they call a sect? They said, what do you think? What's your opinion of these, these people? But they make their opinion known at the end of the sentence that everywhere is spoken against. Notice how they put that in. Everybody's against it. We want to know what you think, but, you know, everybody's talking against it. it it's, it's a bad thing. But we want to know what you, isn't that, isn't that just like people? That, it's the same. It's the same. They, pe people are going to go somewhere. They find one or two to agree with them. <clears throat> when they find one or two to agree, they're going to go around and dip, 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 dip. everybody, everybody said, dip, dip. everybody said, nobody likes it. Dip, dip, dip. Can, can, I, can I plug in a little piece of advice that I learned as chairman of the deacons of this church several years ago? If you don't put them in their place and stop it, then you agree with them. Now, I'm telling you, if they come to you in their complaint and their garbage and you just, mm -hmm, and you like your listen to you going, then when you go on, well, I was talking to Donald and, and he agrees and we did. No, we didn't. But if you didn't make it known, if you didn't stop their complaint, if you didn't let them know, I don't agree with that thought. And if you, if you didn't let them know that you're sowing discord among the brethren, you're putting yourself in a bad spot, then you become part of their little everybody, right? And that's kind of what you see. That's not a new thing. That's people. That's the nature of people. You see it in the Jews. Well, everybody says it. Everybody's against it. So they, they, they tell Paul, they want to hear his take on this. They, they, they want to hear what you got to say, but, but they make their opinions known by calling it a sect. By calling it a sect, that means to them it was the same thing as heresy. They're, they're making it clear that to them it is a reproach, and everywhere it's spoken against. <clears throat> what we see that... In, in the text, as long as Paul was speaking about the chains, as long as Paul was speaking about his arrest, as long as Paul was speaking about those things, they never interrupted. They, they just sat and listened as he talked about chains. <clears throat> but the minute he got to the main point, the minute he got to the hope of Israel, the minute he got to Jesus Christ, the minute he got to the reason he was at Rome, now they said, <clears throat> <clears throat> let me just interrupt you right there just a minute before you go any further. We, we don't know anything about what you're talking about, uh, about why you're a prisoner. We don't know any of that. But you might want to know where we stand on this, on this Jesus fellow. You might want to know. Now, now we, we go, we're going to let you speak. We, we want to know more about what you have to say. But you need to understand our position on it. See, it's just like the world. You can talk about anything you want with them, and as long as you're talking, they're listening, they're active participants, they're fine. But the minute you get to the main thing, the minute you get to Jesus, the minute you get to the one thing that changed my life like nothing ever had or ever could, well, man, I got to go. Had a good time chatting. Hope you have a nice day. Isn't it amazing how when you try to tell them the best part of their life, that's the part they don't want to hear. <coughs> that's what we see in these guys right here. They've, they've not heard anything, but now they get to that. They're like, we've heard a lot about this, and everybody is against it. Just before you open your mouth, everybody's against it, including all of us elders, us Jewish leaders. Now, you were saying what? Verse 23 says that they, they set up a meeting time. Except a time when they could bring more with them um, based on the text that when they had appointed a day, there came many into his lodging. So the apostle Paul's house is full. They, they've gone out. They've told people about this and people have heard. I'm sure there's a lot of anxious people that want to hear this. I'm sure there's a lot of anxious Christians that want to gather around Paul. Some of them right now may be sitting back waiting to let the dust settle a little bit. Because they see all the Jews gathered around them. They know that these Jews are the ones that punish Christians. They're still the ones that are out to get them. So I don't know. 
I don't know that the church really turns out a lot. Here it doesn't say, but one thing we know, you got a house full of people because they set up a day. We're going to come back, and we're going to get your take on this Jesus. We're going to find out what you think about this sect, about this, this heresy. We're, we're going to come back. And it says, they came into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. I imagine Paul had a lot to say, wouldn't you? You know, we've seen Paul's testimony shared several times here in the last part of Romans, uh, or last part of the book of Acts, before, before going to Rome. We, we've seen his testimony shared by him. We've seen it shared by Luke. Luke wrote about it. It wasn't part of what Paul said, but I, I'm sure that got shared again right here. Luke apparently just didn't choose to write it again, but he said something because he talked about Jesus all day long. They got there that morning, and he said, while I got your attention, I'm going to keep you. See, I got some folks. I might have some folks may not be back Sunday because we didn't get out of here probably about 12, 20 Sunday. We might have talked a little bit long, but I didn't talk as long as Paul. I mean, we got here at 1030, and we was out by 12, 20, and ate lunch. He don't say nothing about no eating. He says, while I got you in the house, you came early, and you're going to stay late. But I'm going to tell you about Jesus. See, he took full advantage of the time that he had. Paul knew his purpose for being at Rome was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to those at Rome. And his first heart is to the Jew. You, you understand this isn't king of Rome. This isn't Caesar. This isn't about the guards. This isn't about the, the Roman citizen, the Gentile. This is back to where his roots started. This is about the Jew. I've called the Jew in. I've got a house full of Jews. I'm trying to reach my people first. Paul knows his day is coming that he's going to preach to the king. He knows he's going to talk to all the authority of Rome. But right now, his concern is about the Jews. And he brings them all in. And he talks to them all day long. He expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Some believe the things which are spoken, some believe not. See, that just shows it doesn't matter who's presenting the gospel. It doesn't matter how strong the Spirit of God is on them. It doesn't matter how much the Holy Spirit anoints them and uses them. There's some people going to turn away. There, there's some people that, that just aren't going to yield. There, there's some people, may, and maybe, maybe they will later. Maybe there'll be another day. Maybe, we don't know, maybe there's a lot of seed planted right here by the Apostle Paul that gets watered later on, and eventually some of those do come to full fruition, and there is some fruit of this labor. But what we know is at this point is that some people heard one of the most godly men that ever walked talk about Jesus Christ and expound. This is a very knowledgeable guy. He's telling them what they know and probably more than they knew because he's a very well-trained rabbi. So he's talking about the law of Moses and all the things. He's probably telling some things that they're like, man, I didn't even know that. He's, he's bringing the whole law. And he brings everything that you believed and everything that was there and everything that was prophesied, everything that the Old Testament spoke of, everything that the law and the prophets wrote, it all pointed to one man. His name's Jesus. Everything that you believed is right, it's true, it's correct. And it has come to pass in this one man, Jesus. He didn't destroy your law. He fulfilled your law. He didn't mess up your religion. He created your religion. He, he didn't just come. He fulfilled a purpose. And you're the reason he came. He spent all day telling them. And it says that some believed not. I don't know. You kind of get a feeling those Jews, when they didn't, <clears throat> when they didn't address Paul that first day, there's so much there that we're not told. You know, we're told a lot of things in it, but this, this last few right here in this whole set, there's, there's so much we're not told. You can dig and get all kind of opinions and all kind of perspectives and theologians and scholars' opinions, but there, there's just a lot of unspoken stuff in this right here. Like, he didn't cover very well why he was arrested, and he talked all day long. Luke don't tell us what he, well, we know what he talked about. I mean, we, we, we know the things that he talked about, what he expounded. But you wonder, why, why did the Jews, why did the elders, when they were there the first time, need to leave and set a time and come back? 
going to take a while? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Were, were they caught off guard? Did, did Paul say something that, that caught them off guard? Did it, I kind of wonder... Did that they think they, they said that everybody's against it, right? You know what we just looked at? That's what they said. Everybody's against it. I kind of wonder to myself, if they're thinking everybody's against it, and we're gonna go get a house full of everybody's, you gotta know they invited people that believed what they believed. You gotta know God brought people that didn't. But you you know they didn't go to the church at Rome to gather Christians to come to this meeting. Anybody agree with that? They went to get who they spoke of. Everybody's against it. They went to the synagogue, to the people that tore down Christians, to the people that didn't believe in Christianity, to the people that didn't believe in Jesus Christ. They went to get as many of them as they could. This 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 ain't nothing but yanseology garbage. I just was wondering... Why did they need to leave and come back? And here was the thought. If they could get his house full of people and show him how wrong he was, and they could intimidate him. Obviously, they don't know Paul. They could intimidate him with a house full of people that are against you. A house full of people. Don't you see all of these Jews? There's not even room to stand in your house. There's people listening in the windows because they can't get inside. It's packed full of people that are against you. Don't you see you're wrong? If they could have gotten the Apostle Paul to have backed down, it would have changed the course of this book. It would have changed the course of humanity. If they, you, you got to know the devil knows that, right? So the devil, I, I just, I just feel like the devil might have known that his few J- Jewish elders were outnumbered by God's one man, and so he needed to buy some time to gather up a whole bunch of his to come in here. But it didn't matter how many of the devil's saints he could bring in. One of God's chosen. To stand on that book and waver not, change the environment. And because of that, on that day, some of those Jewish elders that they brought in to be their witnesses got saved. Walked in against Paul, walked out in the family of Paul through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what our situation is. You always got to stand with the book. Doesn't matter who stands before you. Doesn't matter what comes against you. You always got to stand with the book. I have no doubt they they came with both barrels loaded. They came with full opposition. But I believe Paul was fully prayed up. Because he was prayed up, he was ready for the challenge. And because he was prayed up and ready for the challenge, we don't know how many, but we know some of them believed. Amen? Well, Lord willing, we'll pick up right there. I hear some fireworks. I guess that's what that is. Either that or something fell back there. Somebody wrecked the wrecked in the parking lot, something's booming off back that way, but I suspect that means the children are about to get cut loose, and since I worked our children's workers 20 minutes overtime Sunday, probably don't need to do that tonight, or I might have to keep myself next Sunday. God, thank you so much. God, thank you for this book. Thank you, God, that, Lord, we can just get lost in studying. God, there's so much there that's for our good and for our benefit and for our teaching and for our strength and for our encouragement for our joy for our happiness god there's just so much in this book thank you for it god lord thank you god for or for every family represented in this place god i pray you go before them as we go out i pray a hedge of protection about them god i pray you use each one of us father to bring glory and honor to you that souls might be saved god use our lives a living testimony strengthen us god that we might be faithful to you We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.